if you go to sleep, I'm hurling that at you right there. I'm telling you, that'd do some damage. I better just set this on the floor so I'm to break something up here. Uh, but I'm glad you're here this morning. Uh, looking forward to starting a new year and, uh, and a very interesting topic, a very important topic. And um, it's been my heart's desire since I became the pastor here to do this. And so we're going on almost three years and we're finally getting around to it. Uh, trying to find the best opportunity to do it uh, amongst everybody's schedule. And, uh, you know, you got your Sunday morning, Sunday night, you got Wednesday. And, and so just trying to figure a lot of those things out. But And so uh, was thinking if we could do it kind of in a Sunday school setting, uh, that would be uh, profitable. So I do appreciate you being here. I know it's different, uh, but I know this is going to be a help and a blessing to you. And uh, it's going to help me as I've been going back through a lot of these things and studying about why we use the King James Bible. Um, this is a topic that is not a secondary issue. Uh, maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago, this would kind of be a mute point to even uh, teach on something like this. But today, um, it is a very critical issue about what Bible. And then when we talk about what Bible, we're obviously talking about English-speaking people. Okay, We're talking about uh, us as, as people that speak English um, and what Bible that we use. And so uh, today, I'm not going to dive into the issues of... Uh, of text and manuscripts, we're going to we're going to deal with that as we go forward, probably next week and maybe only even into week three. This morning, I believe that the the reason that we do have the Word of God in its perfection, and the greatest evidence of that is actually in the pages of Scripture itself. And so this morning, I want to deal with it's a faith issue. It's simply a faith issue, and I want to talk to you about why by faith we can rest that we do in fact have the Word of God from the pages of Scripture. And I've given you a verse here at the top in the book of Psalms, uh, Psalm 11, verse number 3. I'm going to read this verse. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, if, uh, since this is our first one and we have an awful lot to cover, and by the way, we might not get to all this today. This is fine. That's why I'm giving you a lot of information in this. You can take it home with you, look at it on your own, and then you can follow up and ask me any questions you'd like to at another point in time. But let's, uh, let's read this verse and go to the Lord in prayer. Psalm 11, verse number 3 there at the top says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for a beautiful morning. And God, we thank you for the privilege to uh, gather here uh, in your house. And God, we pray as we go through this study uh, that you would uh, give us, uh, uh, God, clear uh, minds and, and uh, honest hearts as we come before your word and uh, learning more about why we use the King James Bible and why it's an important uh, doctrine uh, for a group of believers to hold to is that we do have a perfect word because you promised to give us one. And uh, I pray we'd see that in the pages of Scripture this morning. Help us, cleanse us, and use us this day for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on in. Make sure you get her back right there. All right. Now I've given you a uh, pretty big quote there. I'm not going to read that, but that's uh, uh, from the defined King James Bible. It uh, gives a good introduction about what the Word of God is. But Let's go ahead and jump to a faith issue that uh, you see on your handout. I have a quote here by Steve Kirkpatrick, and I'm going to reference uh, Brother Steve a few other times. I'm going to give you or show you an example of his work. Um, Brother Steve Kirkpatrick, right now, as I'm standing here, he's teaching right across the way in a Sunday school class at Philadelphia Baptist Church. He's a member of that church. He is a, uh, a Bible instructor, a professor in the Bible college over there. And Brother Steve has done... A marvelous job in his study in the King James Bible. He went to Germany. He's been to England. He's went through all that, and he's kind of uh, devoted much of his ministry, his adult ministry, to the defense of the King James Bible. And so I took this out of his book here. So I, I want to read it to you. It says there are two opposite positions, which may be taken, and everyone must make a choice. You can start from a position of belief and apply the logic of faith and arrive at a position of maximum certainty that we do indeed have the true Word of God in the King James Bible. You may also start from a position of doubt and apply the logic of unbelief, and you will arrive at a position of maximum uncertainty in the reliability of God's Word. And so this morning, we've got a few more came in, guys. You want to take those back to them? That's why this morning I want to just speak to you on the, the topic of a faith issue when we come to the Word of God. And as we look in some of these scriptures, you'll see very plainly, very clearly, God promised not only to give us His Word, 
Uh, and when he gave it, he was given it by inspiration, and we'll talk about that. He promised to preserve it. So that's the big debate today. Very, very seldom will you ever find anyone that claims to believe the Word of God that will say that it was not inspired. Everyone believes in inspiration. But where the dividing line comes is in the doctrine of preservation. Do we still have it today? And so that's what we're going to think about this morning. I've given you some scenarios to think about. Do you doubt the work in creation because scientists deny it? Do you doubt the miracles in the Bible because infidels deny them? Do you doubt the virgin birth of Jesus Christ because doctors deny it? Do you doubt the return of Jesus Christ because scoffers say he will not come? And I think to all those questions, we would probably say we do not doubt because of those people. Now, we come to this issue on the Word of God. Now, I'm not a science guy, and so, but you think about all that's out there. Last night, we finally got a break in the weather a little bit, and it cleared up some, and it was a, a pretty nice uh, night there. And I walked outside and just looked up again, and I, you just see the stars. It's just amazing. And it brought back to my mind again, if God can do all that of just what I can see with my mortal eye, you've been in an airplane, you can see much more. You just look down, it's just amazing. Look in a telescope and be able to reach out and see much of the heavens. If God can do all that and keep it by the word of his power, it's not a hard thing for God to preserve and keep a book. It's not a hard thing. I mean, he's God after all. If uh, Jesus can turn, uh, you know, a few hush puppies and a few fishes into a, uh, a banquet for thousands, this isn't that tough. And so... Why do we believe that? First of all, it's a faith issue. I believe that we indeed, indeed have the Word of God. Do you doubt the King James Bible is the inspired, preserved, infallible, and inerrant Word of God because some worldly, wise, and educated person cast doubt on it? Now, I want to make this point right at the beginning. We're going to dive in. I want you to understand. I'll put it right here. Please understand this. Those who attack the King James Bible as being the perfect Word of God for English-speaking people and hold to it as the final authority for all faith and practice. Do not believe that we have a perfect word of God in existence today. That includes all of the other translations as well. You would think if someone that was going to say that we don't have the, or that would say that the King James Bible is not the perfect word of God. I would expect a person to say that at least give me what they think is the perfect word of God. But you will never, ever hear them say that. You know why? They don't believe we have one. They don't believe that the ESV is. They don't believe the NIV. They don't believe the New King James. They don't believe the New Living Translation. They don't believe the Good News Bible. They don't believe the message. They don't believe this, that, and the other. They don't believe that we have the perfect word of God anywhere in existence today. And, folks, this isn't just talking about the, the ungodly crowd as far as unbelievers. This is, I'm talking about people in seminaries. I'm talking about professors that's got a lot of letters out beside their name. They do not believe that we have the word of God today. That's a problem. And I want to show you that we indeed do and God has orchestrated such that we would have it. Number one, you see there at the bottom, the Bible is from God. Number one, God's preordained determination. The Scripture existed in the heart and mind of God before the foundation of the world. Before God used the first man to pin down the first word, the Word of God already existed. The emphasis, He is on the source or the Word of God and on the importance of the Word of God. I've given you Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Page 2, Psalm 119, verse 152. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. Keep in mind, as we've said, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Before, by the way, we would not know anything unless God revealed it. Would, would we agree with that? God has to reveal himself. Before, that's why the Bible says, in the, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. So we can't know God unless God reveals himself. Now, he's revealed himself in creation. We know that. He's revealed himself through the conscience of man. And now, as we see, we have the totality of his word. He 
has revealed his word in completion. Now that was progressive. He didn't do it all at one time. It was progressive revelation. But in the fact of, it's still true that God has to reveal himself. And God reveals himself primarily through language. God spoke. People understood. You know, God doesn't have a problem with translation either. Because he is the author of language. Doesn't have a problem with that. We'll see more of that as we go forward. John chapter number 1. I do want you to turn there in your Bible. I didn't list that one for you. John chapter number 1. And I want you to look in verse number 1. So the book that we hold, the scriptures that we have, they are eternal. The word is settled. By the way, if the world if if the word is settled in heaven, it ought to be settled on earth. There shouldn't be a uh, an issue about whether we have the word of God. If it's settled in heaven, it ought to be settled in our hearts this morning. John chapter number one, verse number one. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We looked at these verses last Sunday night. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. These verses bring before us the eternal nature of God's Word. Now, a lot of times we talk about in these verses, and it's true, the eternal uh, nature of Jesus Christ. But understand that He's referred to as the Word. Now, the Word is already settled in heaven. He's known of old thy uh, testimonies, uh, that thou hast founded them forever. So these verses also show the spiritual relationship between the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the living incarnate Word, and the Word of God, which is the living written Word. You cannot, I want you to understand this this morning, you cannot separate Jesus Christ from the Word. The way you treat one is the way you treat the other. This is important. As we look probably in session three and definitely in session four, I'm going to show you example after example with some of these modern translations. You know the number one doctrine that they diminish, the number one doctrine is the deity of Christ. Why is that? It's because they don't believe that we have the word of God and therefore they're going to strip away Jesus Christ of his deity in these other modern versions. You'll see that as we go forward. Acts 15, verse number 8, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. God's preordained determination is that the word was already settled. Before Genesis 1-1 ever shows up in the pages of Scripture, God in his mind and his heart had Genesis 1-1 through Revelation 22-21 already settled in heaven in its perfection. Look at number 2, God's divine inspiration. God's divine inspiration. Now, I've got Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Now, you might have heard this before, but if you want to know the, the best rendering of the English language in words and, and, and uh, definitions and so on and so forth, you need to get you a Webster's 1828 Dictionary. It's by far the best. I don't know if you could find one maybe in bookstores around here. I haven't tried. I know you can buy them online, and you can get those. And so that's the best place uh, to, to find what words mean in high English. Uh, but they give this definition of inspiration. It says, The infusion of ideas into the mind by the Holy Spirit, the conveying into the minds of men ideas, notices, or uh, munitions uh, by extraordinary and supernatural influence, or the communication of the divine will to the understanding by suggestions or impressions on the mind, which leave no room to doubt the reality of their supernatural origin. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That is in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. They actually quote Scripture and tie it into the Word of God. That's impressive, isn't it? You won't find that probably in modern dictionaries today. But they recognize that it is the Holy Spirit and that's conveying this to the minds and ideas of men. And so it's outside of man. It's not man pinning down what man wants to pin down. But God's divine inspiration. Now, I've given you here 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. It says, From a child that has known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, that's important. That means 
that, that obscure passage that you really don't like to read, maybe it's in the book of Numbers, maybe it's in uh, Psychic Chronicles when it lists about three pages worth of names. Guess what? Those scriptures, those words are just as much inspired as Romans chapter 5, verse 8. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Every bit of it. And so it's important. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in the dark place until the day dawn and the day star arises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. That means there's nowhere in the Bible where you can take a verse and say, this is what it means without connecting it and comparing it to other verses in the Bible. The greatest commentary on the Word of God is the Word of God. It's the greatest dictionary about the Word of God. If you'll stay with it, read it long enough, you'll see, ah, that's what that means. Or I remember that Scripture there. You're comparing Scripture with Scripture. It's of no private interpretation. For the prophecy, now this is where the focal point is this morning, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. This book didn't come by the will of man. Notice this. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So as you read in the pages of Scripture, I know a lot of times we say, well, John said in his gospel, or we say that, well, Paul said, or, or Ezekiel said. Now, they were just a human instrument. But God, through the Holy Ghost, moved them to pin down the words that you and I have today. And so this book is a Holy Spirit-inspired book. It's important to realize that inspiration applies to the words of God and not uh, to the men who wrote them down. Remember, we don't revere and we don't worship the men that actually wrote the Bible. And that's true for the King James translators. We're going to talk about some of these men. And, I mean, these men were great men of God. Uh, They were very skilled. They were very uh, fluent in multiple languages. When we talk about one guy, he, he could speak fluently Hebrew and Greek by the time he was six years old. You don't find people like that today. As a matter of fact, there's not people today that even live. Uh, there's nobody on planet Earth that can do what some of these men and were at where they were as far as language and stuff. They don't exist. But understand, the men that pinned the Word of God down, they were not perfect. They were not perfect. So we don't worship them. We recognize that God used them as instruments to get His Word out. And he moved on them by the Holy Ghost. Now, we believe in verbal inspiration. You see right there, it says, The Bible teaches that uh, the individual words of Scripture are inspired. That is verbal inspiration. More than 800 times the Bible uses the phrase, saith the Lord, showing that God speaks using words. Words are the God-given means of articulating our thoughts. Therefore, words, individual words, are important. Now, this is going to be paramount when we get to looking at some of these translations. You say, well, it's not a big deal just to change a word. Uh, Ask Adam and Eve that. (laughs) Satan just changed just a little bit, didn't he? And I love a a preacher by the name of Curtis Hudson. He's gone on to be with the Lord, but he uh, preached a message one time. It's very simple, but he said, things that are different are not the same. And so that's the, the, the bill of goods that have been sold today. Well, it's, uh, it's just like these others. Well, if, if it's a different name and you're changing words and stuff like that, it's not the same. And so we believe in verbal inspiration. Every single word matters in order to be in there. Exodus chapter 24, verse number 4. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. Notice it didn't say he wrote the summary or he wrote the ideas just to convey a thought. He wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill, twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Exodus thirty four twenty seven. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words have I made a covenant with thee and with Israel. 
Uh, we'll read Jeremiah 30. You can read those other ones on your own. Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. Isn't that interesting? We see here in Jeremiah, we're going to see some other books. You know, there's some other books that are within the, the Bible itself. And those are preserved too. You ever heard of the book of life? Is it important that that one's right? Yeah, I think that'd be pretty important, wouldn't it? You think God can preserve that one? Well, I hope he can. <laughs> he sure can. He sure can. And he preserved this one right here too. Go to the next page there, number all right, we're still on uh, talking about divine inspiration. Since words have meaning, to add words or subtract words will alter the meaning of the Word of God. We see this in politics all the time, don't we? I mean, all the time. They're just one little word. Oh, will you, say, will you mean it like this? And they got to come back and they say, we've we, we got to get the tone and how they said it and all this other stuff. Listen to me. Words do have meaning. So... Those who are writing one false version of the Bible after another tell us that words are not important. They say it is only the thoughts or concepts that need to be preserved. If there is something in this life to handle with care and precision, it is the Word of God. So we believe in verbal inspiration. The second form of inspiration we believe in is plenary inspiration. The Bible teaches that all the Bible in its completeness and entirety is inspired. That is plenary inspiration. Plenary inspiration teaches us that every part of the Bible is equally inspired. And so again, the totality, all the 66 books of the Bible, they're all inspired. It's not just a few passages in the Gospels or in Paul's epistles or in the, uh, the law or any of that. Every bit of it is inspired in order to treat it as such. Romans 10 verse 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Can you imagine hearing by the thoughts of God? No, it's by the actual words of God. The words of God. Ephesians 6, verse 17, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I like 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men. That's the problem with unbelievers today. They recognize and they say, Well, this book is just the word of men. No, it's not. It's the word of God. To receive such is to receive God's word. But as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that what? Believe. You know why I believe uh, many people doubt that we even have the word of God or have it in its entirety and all these other things that we've already been talking about? They don't believe. They don't believe. Again, it is a faith issue. You want the word of God to go to work in your life? I will guarantee you how it won't happen. It won't happen with you casting doubt that you even have it. It won't happen. That's what this verse says. The Word of God, if you receive it as it is in truth, the Word of God, it will effectually work in you that believe. It's a faith, it's a faith book. It's a spiritual book. Hebrews 4, 12, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing sunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Do you want to know why many times uh, these uh, professors and scholars, why they rail on the King James? That verse right there. You won't find a Bible that will cut you inside and out like this King James Bible will. You won't find a Bible that is precise in its doctrine. You won't find a Bible that is, is put together in such a way that reveals the thoughts and intents of mankind. You know that's what the Holy Spirit does. So let me ask you this. If the Holy Spirit inspired this book and preserved this book, and he did, that means these other ones, it don't have the power that that one right there has. And all you got to do is look at the fruit of it. All you got to do is look at the people that rail against this. Winston Churchill said this. He says, you've got enemies, good. That means you've stood for something in your life. You know who has a lot of enemies? This book right here. This book right here. You'll never find an ESV person railing against an NIV person. Never. Not one time, but they'll all come together to come against this one. The thoughts and intents of the heart. Let me go ahead and just go ahead and mention this. You know this book does not have a copyright on it. This King James Bible does not have a copyright. If you wanted to today, you could go anywhere. You could go to Office Max or Office Depot. I don't know which one you got here in Calhoun. 
And you could go and make a copy of this and pass it out all over Gordon County. You could do it. You know this is public domain. If you got the Bible app on your phone, it'd be a good exercise for you to do this one day. I got Bible Gateway on mine. You may have another form there. But you can, get, you, know, you can click on these different versions there. Do that. Go to the passage. Go to the bottom. And you'll see where it says, uh, for the King James, it'll say public domain. Go to another one, and it'll say copyright, and it'll have mul multiple years because that means, well, we had the Word of God in 1973, but then we got it again in 1984, and then we got it again in 1989, and then we got it again in 96. You know what they're doing? They're making money. It's a money-making business. And every time that you get a new copyright, guess what you got to do? You got to change 20% of the one that you just had. So you get, a, you get a Bible over here in 1973, and then when you do it again in 1984, guess what? You've got to change legally for a copyright. You've got to change that book. Your version of the Bible has to change 20%. And then do you another one. That's 40% off the one that you did. Do you another one. That's 60% off the one that they did. It's a money-making business. The King James Bible. Now, there may be, if you have a study Bible that has like notes in it and stuff like that, you may find one that has a copyright, but that's because of the notes, not because of the King James Bible. If you've got a, just a King James Bible with nothing but the Bible in it, there is absolutely no copyright to the Word of God. You know why? They want to, they want to get it out. They want everybody to have it. They want a copyright on the Word of God. But anyway, we'll deal with that later. So, inspiration in the middle of the page there is a one-time act that applies to the original manuscripts. This one-time act of inspiration is applied to the King James Bible by preservation and therefore is perfectly correct to refer to the King James Bible as being the inspired Word of God. Number three, God's supernatural preservation. God gave His Word by divine inspiration. He now preserves it by supernatural preservation. Go to 1 Peter right there. You see it? In verse uh, number 23 through 25, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of God, or excuse me, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which by the gospel is preached unto you. Now, I didn't put it here, but do you remember over there in Matthew chapter number 24? Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Now, we can find that fulfillment in Revelation chapter number 20. Heaven and earth does pass away. You know what's still there? The Word of God. The Word of God is still there. But this we see, that the Word of the Lord endureth forever. Psalm 119, 160, thy word is true from the beginning. In every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Now, supernatural preservation is an ongoing process, unlike divine inspiration, which is a one-time act. Think about this in the relationship between salvation and sanctification. So, you got saved in a moment of time. It was a, the moment that you, by faith, trusted Jesus as your Savior, His work on the cross as being your own, as your salvation. That was a one-time transaction transaction done sealed until the day of redemption then you start on your path of sanctification in what we sometimes call the the christian life or your walk with the lord and so that is a ongoing process and so as we look into we're going to speak more about this next week because we understand uh hebrew aramaic and greek primarily hebrew and greek is was the languages that god used as the bible was being inspired number one and two being preserved and so now we have in england we're going to talk about how all that came to be okay but understand inspiration is a one-time thing we the book is already inspired we don't need any more inspiration but it's the preservation of the scriptures and like we said that's the dividing line that's the dividing line they say well he inspired it but they say he only inspired it in the originals now if that's true listen to me there are not any originals in existence at all anywhere on planet Earth. None of them. Now that would bother me if I had faith in that only the originals were inspired and preserved. 
that would tell me, just like they say, that we don't have the Word of God today, if it was only in the originals. But listen, we're going to see here in just a few moments, God doesn't care that much about the originals. Now that destroys a lot of uh, classes that they're going to teach. I could teach it in about 10 seconds. I'd say, guess what? God isn't worried about the originals. You don't believe me? What, do you do the, what, what happened to the originals of the, of the law when Moses was coming down? <laughs> yeah, they got broke, didn't they? He doesn't care about the originals. You know why? Because he's God and he can preserve it. And he can see to it that man always has it. And look right here. Supernatural preservation ongoing. Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. We talked about that word, uh, or the number seven. Our Wednesday night study speaks of spiritual perfection. And so if the word is tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, that speaks of the perfection that we have in the purity of the word of God. Thou shalt keep them. The them is referring to the words. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt what? Them. The them are the words from this generation forever. Case closed. We can just go home, right? What a wonderful verse. The words are pure. God is going to preserve them. Now, I believe that verse, and I hope you do too. Now, since He's promised that, now we have to figure out where are those preserved words that He promised. And that's why we're going through this, because I believe, and I hope you do too, that we do have them here in this King James Bible. Psalm 19, verse 8, The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Psalm 119, verse 140, Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Proverbs 30, verse 5, Every word of God is pure. Do you see about the purity of the word of God? He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. In the period between the original transmission of the writing of our English King James Bible, impurities had to be purged from God's Word. Some mistakes were by godly men, and some corruptions were injected by ungodly apostates. We're going to dive more into that as we deal with the manuscript and the translators and all that stuff over the next two weeks. But understand, this was a process to get us to a place to where we have the perfect Word of God in our language in the English language now number four we see God's providential application inspiration and preservation do apply to accurate copies and translations of the original autographs Jesus the apostles and the early church all believe they had the word of God get this even though none of them had the original autographs now that's what they won't tell you they'll say the originals were inspired but they'll never tell you what happened to them? In the times when, when, you, when we see these verses and Jesus references the Scriptures, He's not referencing the originals. Now understand when I say Je I'm talking about in His earthly incarnation. I know Jesus is eternal. He's the Word. I understand that. I'm talking about when He references the Scriptures, He's not talking about the originals. He's talking about copies of the originals. Same is true for the Apostles. Same is true for anybody else. When they reference that, they are not talking about the original. You know what? They didn't have them. They didn't have them. So did they believe that they had the Word of God? Most certainly they did. Look in, again in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. The, from a child that has known the Holy Scriptures. Now when Paul pins this down, he's talking about all those, the Holy Scriptures that they had, would be what we would call the 39 books of the Old Testament. And guess what? He recognized them as being Scriptures, Holy Scriptures although he did not possess the originals. Guys, when you know what I'm talking about the originals, I'm talking about you could go and you could find a copy, or excuse me, not a copy, but you could see the original Declaration of Independence. Now, National Treasure is not true. I don't think it has a, a, a treasure map on the back of it, okay? But that's the, that's the one where Thomas Jefferson, it's his handwriting, right? We, uh, he, he wrote it down, okay? In Congress, July 4th, 1777. 
He wrote it all down. See that. When Jesus is talking about, it's not that they went back and they, they looked at the uh, Hebrew scrolls there. Oh, this is the original. This is the one that Moses pinned down. That's not it. They were, the, the only thing they had, you know when Jesus went into the, uh, the synagogue and he quoted, he stood up to read and he took the book and he quoted the book of Isaiah. You know what he was reading from? A copy. He wasn't reading from the original. You know what he said? This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. He didn't call it. He said the scripture. It was a copy. It was a preserved, perfect copy. We're going to talk about how the hell they did all that. But listen to me. That's what he was quoting. Now look in Luke chapter number 4. Well, I should have just waited a second. I put it right here in the outline. Luke 4, verses 17 through 21. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, and sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recover the sight of the blind, and to set liberty to them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened to him. And he began to say to them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, that was a messianic scripture. You know, he was saying, here I am. I'm the one. And that's why their eyes was fattened. When he read that, they, those religious crowd, they looked at him saying, they didn't say it, but what they were thinking, he's claiming to be the Messiah. And Jesus said, you better believe I am today. This scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Luke chapter number 24, verses 25 through 27. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expanded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Referencing Moses. Now when we talk about Moses, you, you probably have Something very similar, maybe in, in the front of your Bible. Uh, yes, I have it in mine. Uh, you most likely have it in yours as well. And uh, right there at Genesis, it says the first book of Moses. You may have that. And so usually when we identify Moses, we're talking about the first five books uh, of the Bible, the Pentateuch. The, uh, the Jews would call it the Torah, the first five there, okay? Genesis through uh, the book of Deuteronomy. And so he says from Moses, and then he says all the prophets. So you go right there from Joshua all the way through Malachi. Can you imagine hearing that sermon? Jesus expounding all the things concerning himself. And so, again, the reference is to he recognized that the copies, not the originals, but the copies were in fact still the Word of God and they were preserved and they were perfect. Now, I want you to take your Bible here and I want you to flip to the book of Romans. To the book of Romans. And I want you to look in at chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. This is going to set us up for what we're going to deal with a little bit next week. I wanted you to see, and I gave you a lot of scripture. I wanted you to see that the greatest evidence, the greatest evidence that we in fact have the word of God today is actually in the Word of God itself. That God, you've seen it on the pages of the Bible, He promised that it would be pure. And so if something is pure, that means there's, there's nothing uh, that is wrong with it. There's no blemish. You know who else is referred to as being pure in your Bible? The Lord Jesus Himself. God Himself, He... Uh, the psalmist said, Thou art of pure eyes to behold iniquity. So if God is pure, Jesus Christ is pure, the Word of God is pure according to the Lord. He promised to preserve it. You've seen it right there in your Bible. He promised to. And he promised that it would be to that generation forever. Romans chapter number 3 and verse number 1 says, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly 
because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. As we look into the study next week, we're going to talk about the Masoretic text. That is the, the Hebrew text in which the King James Bible is translated from. There's a group that was known as the Masoretes. That's where we get the term, the Masoretic text. Understand this about the nation of Israel, about the Jews in general. They were given the task. God revealed himself to them unlike any other nation. He actually says that in his word. I came to you. I didn't, I didn't go to them. I chose you, not because you were great, because you were actually weaker. You were smaller. I'm going to uh, d- uh, display my glory and strength through this people. But one of the things that God did, he committed, he gave them the oracles of God. He spoke to them, and he gave them a system in which to write down and keep that word all the way through. And so they were so meticulous in doing that, and they did an excellent job of doing it. And so that's the the Old Testament scriptures is based off that text. Then we're going to talk about the the Hebrew text, and we'll talk about the Greek text that our King James Bible is translated from, and it's called the Texas Receptus or referred to sometimes as the receive text. And we're going to see why that is very important when we're talking about Bible translations. And we're going to see there's another stream of manuscripts. These uh, streams that come here are coming from uh, the Masoretic text and the Texas Receptus. And then there's another one uh, that comes out primarily that's the uh, translation of the New Testament, but it flows not from... Uh, that Texas Receptus, which was from Antioch, the, the, the hub there for uh, first uh, century Christianity, the hub of the Apostle Paul, there's another one that flows from Alexandria, Egypt. Now, if you've studied your Bible for any length of time, you know that Egypt is a type of darkness and sin. So when you follow these through the, the stream of manuscripts, Every other modern translation, they don't get it from the Hebrew Masoretic and the Texas Receptus. They get it from over here. And you're going to see this. It's not as complicated as people make it out. Now, to say that, understand there's people that devote their entire ministries to what we're talking about this morning. We're going to try to do it in four weeks. We won't be able to cover everything under the sun. I want to give you the basics of it. And then in week four, I'm going to give you a list of some books, of some video clips or whatever that you can actually go and and find out more about this stuff on your own. Um, Wildly debated topic out there. And so I want you to be informed, not that, and even myself, I I can't spend my whole uh, life in ministry uh, defending the King James Bible, though I do defend the King James Bible because I believe it's the Word of God. And I think you ought to know why and you have the confidence that you have the Word of God. Because, listen to me, if we don't have the Word of God, you know it speaks about uh, in Hebrews that, that we have confidence, we have an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast. You know what that is? That's this book. And in times in your life, when you get confused or when you get down and when things happen, listen to me, you better have a source that you can anchor your soul in. And you better have confidence when you go to that source, God's going to speak to you through that book. And he's given it to you in its entirety. So I appreciate you being here this morning. Any questions on what we talked about this morning or comments uh, about the handout or anything like that? Anybody got anything? I taught it that well. I'm proud of myself. There's a lot to deal with this. I'm trying to condense it all down and just kind of give you the meat and potatoes of it here. And uh, you can go back and, and uh, with a fine-tooth comb and go back through some of it. But, uh, but again, I, 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 do, I do trust and hope that you have confidence that we do have the Word of God. And maybe if you don't, by the end of week four here, uh, you will as, as we talk about it uh, together. Now, let me say this, and I'll close here, and uh, we'll do a few prayer requests before uh, we leave. I'm King James only, but I'm not King James honorary. There's some people that are King James only, and I appreciate their stance, but they are very much, I don't think they have the right spirit about it. 
okay? And you don't have to have the King James even in this church. I'm, I don't have dominion over your faith. That's between you and the Lord. Now, for all teaching and preaching, we use the King James. I believe it's important for what we're going to talk about later. I think we all got to be hearing from the same one because they're not the same, and I'll show you some of these things. But that's, that's your conviction. That's your conviction. I'm not, I'm not the Bible police, and I'm going to send out, you know, all right, y'all round up anybody that doesn't have a kid. I'm not doing that, okay? And I still love you. I hope to change your mind on it, but I still love you. And uh, there's no, you know, break in fellowship. But I do believe it's important for a church to decide what they do believe is the Word of God and go with that one book for teaching and preaching because I think it leads to confusion if it's not. Y'all follow me there? So I, I, did, I did want to make that point uh, before we dismiss this one. In prayer requests, uh, we need to make mention of it this time.